So it's my pleasure to introduce tonight Dr. Claudia Rutenberg from the University of British Columbia, where she teaches uh, philosophy of education in their educational studies department. Uh, given that our guest tonight has written extensively on the topic of ethics of hospitality and education, it seemed appropriate to pause and reflect on how to welcome her as a guest into our space. How does an introduction give a place for a guest to enter and be present? What is a hospitable introduction? While our academic conventions dictate that I read a list of accomplishments, major awards, grants, and services, I'm not certain that this is such a hospitable gesture. It seems that such a list holds the guest at a certain distance. The guest as a singularity, as an individual, disappears behind a kind of professional mask which he or she has to wear in order to be recognized as a valued asset. In other words, the standard introduction makes place for the CV of the guest and not the guest as such. Perhaps there is another way of conceptualizing the work of the introduction. Perhaps the introduction should introduce not what a person has accomplished, but rather open up a space that prepares us all for a particular kind of encounter, prepares us to surrender ourselves to the guest. Such an introduction would not assure the audience who the speaker is so much as prepare the audience to be affected in a particular way. My own encounter with our guest has always been one that is marked by a series of translations. Although she is considered an educational philosopher and is employed as such, I would argue that Dr. Rutenberg is not a philosopher so much as a translator or translator philosopher or philosopher in translation. While Dr. Rutenberg has written on the topic of philosophy as translation, I would like to foreground translation not simply as a theme in her work, but as a kind of defining gesture. It is this gesture that I wish to introduce. In terms of her methodological approach, uh, her work is a translation across differences that often divide things such as analytic from continental philosophy, educational theorists from practitioners, queer theorists from logicians, and so on. Her work resides in a space opened up by translation, where familiarity gives way to the unfamiliar, where convergence and divergence seem to slip in and out of one another. In relation to disciplinary and institutional boundaries, she often translates between educational, curatorial, artistic, and even medical disciplines. In terms of her style of writing, she translates between the most opaque prose of deconstruction and a crisp, precise, and grounded educational intervention that speaks widely to communities of practice and advocacy. Pedagogically, her work teaches that it is precisely in moments of translation where we can't find the right word, when there is no hard and fast rule, and yet we have to judge, that is, the best, that is, that is where the, best, the most interesting and most valuable form of education emerges one that wrestles with dislocations and disruptions as essential rather than peripheral aspects of learning. Given Dr. Uh, Rudenberg's commitment to translation, I offer this introduction as a way to prepare us to encounter the gesture of translation, a translation that might put us all at risk of dislocation and defamiliarization of what it means to be an educator, art educator, and artist. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rudenberg. Thank you. Thank you to um, Jason and to um, for inviting me here, which is um, uh, a real pleasure. Um, and thank you for that marvelous introduction. Um, I am really happy to be introduced as a translator more than anything else. And um, I had no idea Tyson was going to uh, talk about that, nor did Tyson have an idea, I think, that I was going to do quite as much translation as I'm actually going to do tonight, uh, because there will be a fair bit of um, now, the invitation to um, speak here has been a really lovely opportunity for me to think back to work I was doing about 15 years ago when I was a policymaker for the Rotterdam Arts Council uh, in the Netherlands, and, um, and to bring that work into conversation with things I've been writing more recently, like an ethic of hospitality. So let me take you back a little bit. So in the late 1990s, before pursuing my PhD um, at Simon Fraser, I worked in the policy division of the Rotterdam Arts Council in the Netherlands. Now, policy work is notoriously invisible, so I can't show you what that work looked like, but I can show you where it took place, which was actually a rather interesting building, um, with um, a facade designed by J.K. Out, who was part of the style like Montreal and, and Rietveld. Uh, and my office was... My office was... 
right behind this sign. Um, the uni. So it was an interesting place to work. Um, the task of the policy division was um, to provide both solicited and unsolicited advice to uh, policymakers in City Hall in, in the gamut um, of the arts. And um, one of the areas in which we provided advice was um, art education in the sense of the educational programs provided by art institutions such as um, museums and theaters. So that's, that was really the focus at the time. It was neither professional art education in academies, nor was it um, art education K-12 at that time in those educational programs. And the city was seeking ways to justify its spending on the arts in light of the changing demographic of the city. Um, in particular, there was a discrepancy between the cultural diversity of the city, rather than with a lot of um, immigrants, and um, the much narrower, older, whiter profile of the audience of the art institutions receiving major funding. And so the city was trying to encourage art institutions to make efforts to um, attract, in particular, more youth um, and more uh, uh, ethnic minorities. Now, before I go on, I should tell you a little bit of the context of art funding. And this will not be a whole talk on um, art and policy, I promise you, but this will, this will go somewhere more interesting, but a little bit of context. So, from the early 20th century in the Netherlands, there was a really strong sense that the government had a role in securing a broad art infrastructure, so the arts were accessible to everybody. And one of the main proponents of this view was Emmanuel Boekman, who was um, a member of the city council of Amsterdam, um, a social democrat. And in his doctoral dissertation in 1930, he articulated the need for sustained government funding of the arts. Now before I go on, especially because we're looking at the, 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 probably the date of that doctoral dissertation and thinking, who is that guy on the cover? This is not Hitler, it is Wuppmann. It is actually a woodcut um, of Wuppmann made in the 1920s. And that is important because um, very tragically, um, after uh, what I'm about to read and his commitment to, uh, to the arts, um, he went on to commit suicide in 1940 when the Germans invaded the Netherlands. Um, so this is not a portrait of Hitler. He wrote, even in the most difficult times, like 1939, in which there is a danger that peoples are dragged into the abyss, one should strive for the ideal of elevating humanity to a higher level of civilization. Now this ideal of edification, here's the first translation, uh, this ideal of edification, there's a really known word for that in Dutch, ideal. That's not a term that translates very easily. It's not something that is a known kind of concept here. Um, it led to a perception for a long time of the arts as a public good, and it has persisted until today. However, the Netherlands have not been impervious to the winds of neoliberal change, and the past decades have seen an emphasis on consumers rather than citizens, uh, user pay principles, and um, a waning commitment to public goods such as the arts. So, by the time I was working on art education policy for the Arts Council, those competing discourses could be felt quite acutely. On the one hand, there was still that uh, public commitment to uh, government funding for the arts, and on the other, there was a desire to justify that government funding based on the demonstrated demand by consumers slash taxpayers. And while the ideal of edification had as one of its benefits the public commitment, this commitment to public funding of the arts, it also came with a rather paternalistic attitude, and some of you might have sensed that already, this whole sort of ideal of edification, elevating humanity to a higher level of civilization. You might have thought, I'm not sure I like the sound of that language. So it really was a quite paternalistic attitude. The idea was not only that the government should safeguard a broad infrastructure in which artists and programmers and curators could do what they did best, but also that citizens, and in particular working class citizens, were in need of moral and aesthetic edification, lifting them to that higher level of civilization. There was an active desire both to bring people to art and to bring art to the people, and to borrow Bookman's words, to elevate the working classes to a higher level of civilization. Now, I had a lot of fun digging around in archives, which are um, a lot of them have been digitized, and in the 1970s, there was actually, um, quite literally, there were art carts where they brought art from uh, one of the municipal museums, in this case in The Hague, uh, to working class neighborhoods. Um, and I think it was literally one of the associate directors of the museum took it to um, one of these neighborhoods. Peter Lamarck, whose, um, whose article on the usefulness of art I quite appreciate, um, attributes this attitude to the moralists in art and aesthetics. And I quote, 
quote from him, art is good, they seem to be saying, at least partially in virtue of being good for you, end quote. So as part of my, my work for, the, for this policy institute, I had in, in a document on art education, I had conversations with um, a large number of educational programmers and, and uh, other folks working for art institutions. And many agreed, yes, we would like to broaden our audience profile. But it was hard to tell sometimes what exactly motivated them to do that. Was it really they were following, following the new strategic policy priorities, sheer enthusiasm for the quote-unquote product they offered, and really wanting to share it with as many people as possible, or still a remnant of this ideal of edification? And in more than one conversation, I would get a sense that this ideal of edification really played a role, and I'd say, so why is art good for people? And if I really wanted to push the point, because they would typically look at me like I had three heads, I'd say, no, 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 so why is it better for a 14-year-old to go to a museum than to go skateboarding? And this was met by a look of incomprehension, because it was completely self-evident to the people I spoke with that those who did not already partake of art would be better off if they did. I was troubled then, and I still am today, by the strategies adopted by some educational programmers and art institutions to bring people to art and bring art to the people as a way of making art accessible. I do believe that the recognition that some people perceive art to be inaccessible, and especially inaccessible to them, is an important point of departure. But I want to discuss this question of access, accessibility, and inaccessibility in a less paternalistic way. So using a metaphor that I've used in more recent work on hospitality as a guiding ethic for education, I might say it's about unlocking the world of art without forcing people through the door. And I think that, that question, unlocking the world of art without forcing people through the door, may be one of the key challenges for art educators. Another may be to welcome people into the world of art without getting in the way of the art. To, rem to remain with this metaphor of hospitality, hosts may be so eager to welcome guests that they forget they have to get off the threshold to let other people pass. So my work on hospitality <coughs> is informed by the work of Derrida, Derrida's ethical hospitality, an ethic in which those in the role of host, because it is really a temporary role that one occupies, those in the role of host give place to newcomers but do not predetermine newcomers' experience. The gesture of welcome in an ethic of hospitality is made lightly, with full respect for the newcomer's decision to arrive or not. It's not made with the confidence that newcomers, once they arrive, have finally made the right decision. So it's, you know, come to this world of art that the host, whoever happens to be in the role of host, already inhabits. Um, but the way Derrida puts it, the other may come, or he may not. I don't want to program him, but rather to leave a place for him to come, if he comes. So that's, that's the kind of gesture I'm trying to um, work with. And unfortunately, in my view, there are some forms of art education that are quite happy to program the other, if he comes. I'm going to give an example that I'll delve into um, in, in some detail, and it is from a fairly recent project, from 2013 to this year, by um, Alain de Botton and John Armstrong, uh, two British uh, philosophers, and, and uh, John Armstrong is also an art historian. And it was called Art as Therapy. Not art therapy, art as therapy, I mean, you may have, you may have heard of it. In this project, the Botton and Armstrong worked with three uh, large art galleries, the Art Gallery of Ontario in Canada, the National Museum in the Netherlands, and the National Gallery of Victoria in Australia. And they focused on providing explanations for how viewers might use works of art to serve concrete therapeutic purposes in their lives. So they provided these explanations on large yellow sticky notes, and you see those, um, you see those here in various galleries. For example, because it's probably really hard to read, this picture on the right um, shows the 1649 painting by uh, Peter Sanadon on the church interior. And the caption on the sticky notes, so I'm talking not about the little regular tags, right, on the left, with the big yellow sticky notes. The caption on that sticky note reads, my life revolves around business, distraction, chaos, Twitter. The painting is presented as a tool for concentration in the domain of work. Other domains of our lives in which we can use artist therapy, so this is from their website and their uh, uh, book and catalog, uh, other areas of our lives in which we may use works of art to provide this kind of therapy are love, self, and 
anxiety, politics, and free time. And the Bhutto and Armstrong opened their book and catalog with the promise that the book offers a solution to the common problem of unsatisfactory encounters with visual art. Quote, we are likely, they write, to leave highly respected museums and exhibitions feeling underwhelmed or even bewildered and inadequate, wondering why the transformational experience we had anticipated did not occur, end quote. And they offer a solution by proposing that works of art, and they explicitly include um, architecture, design, and crafting that, well, is a therapeutic medium that can help guide, exhort, and console its viewers, enabling them to become better versions of themselves. Um, in particular, they identify seven common psychological frailties that human beings are prone to, and then they talk about the kinds of therapy that works of art can provide. I have a really hard time not mocking this, as you can tell. So, um, <laughs> On the next slide, the, I, I, the, the human frailties are described in my, uh, in my words, but they're summarized from their work and the way they describe the solutions on the right are direct quotations from their book. So we suffer from forgetfulness, loss of hope, general suffering, lack of balance, lack of self-knowledge, closed-mindedness and desensitization, and on the right we see all the kinds of things works of art can do for us. And this is their way of making art accessible. And they give all kinds of examples of how works of art can provide these remedies. For example, in response to the human frailty of um, hopelessness and loss of hope, they note that artists have created works that can remind us of the possibility of renewal and redemption and repair. Quote, art can help us with our tendency to lack hope because we think the best kind of behavior is too far above us, too difficult and too hard, end quote. If we live in a country with a traumatic and violent past, art can help us process this difficult <coughs> history and regain a sense of hope. One work that does this, they argue, is Crystal and Jean Clos' work, Wrapped Reichstag, 1995. Um, and I'm going to just read out this description because I want to pa I want to uh, pair it with a whole bunch of other uh, ways to interpret that work. I just you know do work on Armstrong and closing that as possible. So they write. John Claude and Crystal did not change the right side, but by covering and then unveiling it, they set up a public opportunity for renewal of the nation's relationship to its foremost political building. It allowed Germany to give its parliament back to itself. The wrapped right side was a secular political form of baptism. Baptism is a symbolic moment in which past wrongs are put aside and the individual is rededicated to the future. Political art has a role to play in allowing nations to learn to start again, even while they acknowledge their guilt for past sins." End quote. Now, as far as I'm concerned, there's nothing wrong with highlighting that one way to interpret right, Rad Reichstag 1995 is by focusing on the symbolic significance of covering and then unveiling. It's quite likely that many viewers associated the Rad Reichstag with a Reichstag under construction, a building undergoing renovations. It's also quite possible that viewers wondered, why this building? What is the significance of the right side? But these are not the only, nor necessarily, the best aspects of the work to attend to. The Bouton and Armstrong are so focused on the content and the message of the work that they ignore the possibility that part of the content might be in the work's very form and surface, the fabric. So Crystal and Jean-Claude provide um, some commentary on their own website. And uh, one of the things they write is, um, throughout the history of art, the use of fabric has been a fascination for artists. From the most ancient times to the present, fabric forming folds, pleats, and draperies is a significant part of paintings, frescoes, reliefs, and sculptures made of wood, stone, and bronze. The use of fabric on the right stack follows this classical tradition. Fabric, like clothing or skin, is fragile. It translates unique quality of impermanence. You know, I think some, someone might look at the Rath Reichs tag and think about the contrast between the hardness of the stone and the softness of the fabric, the masculinity of the angular building and the femininity of the draped folds, the seriousness of the political institution and the frivolity of dressing it up. And someone might put these observations about you know, form and content, the meaning of, of the building, the materiality of the fabric, together, as did New York Times art critic Paul Goldberger. From him. Even today, with roughly three quarters of the facade wrapped, 
this immense stone hulk, a heavy, bombastic building that epitomizes German excesses of the 19th century, is rendered light, almost delicate. The building is shimmering where it once was solid, refined where it once was gross and heavy, but it has lost not, none of its power. So I'm just putting all these different possibilities next to each other um, to then say, you know, this, this insistence that this is a work of therapeutic value that is about, fundamentally about, mineral redemption and all that by extremely limiting. In my view, if someone had come away from looking at the wrapped rice tag, not having thought about renewal, redemption, or baptism, or hope, if they hadn't experienced the work as therapeutic in any way, would they have missed the work's purpose? Not at all. In my view, the work did its work if it intervened in any way in how the person looked at the rice tag. Full stop. If the viewer could make no personal connection between their life and the work, but they paused to look at the right stack just because they'd never seen it in this way, wrapped in cloth, the work would have done its work. So I agree with uh, the British art critic, Adrian Searle, and he had a delightfully snarky piece um, in The Guardian after visiting their exhibition in the, in the National Museum of Holland. He writes, with their smarmy servants and symptomology of human failings, their aphorisms about art leading us to better parts of ourselves. The Bourbon's texts feel like being doorstep. But art contains concentrated doses of the virtues. You could coerce any work at all into this cause of mental hygiene and spiritual well-being. I do hear echoes of this um, ideal of edification, right, and elevating humanity to a higher plane. De Bourbon, right, so, reduces art to its discernible content. He doesn't make us want to look at all. That, to me, is what's extremely significant in what Searle is pointing out. He doesn't make us want to look at all. So my way of putting that is to say, in rescuing something that doesn't need rescuing, they end up constraining what art can do. Instead of making art more accessible to those who allegedly do not find access to art on their own, they end up telling visitors what they find when they get there, thus in fact eliminating the need for a visit in the first place. Their approach, and that's why I wanted to go into some detail, is to me a very poignant example of a kind of art education that gets in the way of the encounter between art and the viewer. So let's look a bit more at this encounter between art and the viewer. John Balochino describes an encounter with a work of art as an experience of being, quote, lost in unfamiliarity and foreignness, and even of, quote, pain and fright from an acute sense of insecurity, end quote. What to do with this object that stares me in the face as I stare it in the face? Or perhaps worse, that remains completely indifferent to my gaze. The unfamiliarity of art is not unlike that of being in a foreign place, a parallel that Balatino also draws, um, as does Jeanette Winterson. Um, I don't know if you know this little collection called Art Objects or Art Objects, depending on how you read it, and it's one of my favorite little collections of essays about, about the arts. And Winterson writes, long looking at paintings is equivalent to being dropped into a foreign city, where gradually, out of desire and despair, a few words, then a little syntax, make a clearing in the silence. Art, all art, not just painting, is a foreign city, and we deceive ourselves when we think it is familiar. So what makes me decide to go and explore this foreign city, or rather to stay away from it? And what if I encounter a work of art inadvertently and I find myself dropped in this foreign city makes me decide to stay there rather than flee? Now I want to suggest that off the bat that in and of themselves the sense, I don't want to go there, or I want to get out of here, are actually perfectly acceptable responses. Um, my main concern is that, is that we have the sense, I don't want to go there, or I want to get out of here because I don't think I'm welcome that it is a place, to use Bourdieu's phrase, not for the likes of us. It's not for my kind of people. I don't know and understand enough to be worthy of the visit. That's my concern, that type of inaccessibility. So differently, it is a concern with unlocking the door to the world of art, or perhaps helping people see the door was never locked in the first place, and they already had everything they needed. But it's not a concern with making sure people enter. So permit me to read an excerpt from the book, uh, from my book, Unlocking the World, as it um, allows me to draw a parallel to the kind of gesture I'm talking about and how I'm imagining uh, hospitable art education. I believe that one of the worst things anyone can do to a child 
is to take away their ability to dream of the future. Now this is not the same thing as telling a child you can be anything you want to be. That's a promise on hand. However, children must be able to develop and sustain the ability to imagine that the future will contain something more, or at least some, more than, or something different from the present as they know it. The 15-year-old character, Del Parsons, in Richard Ford's novel Canada, illustrates this well when he describes how the older boys he watches playing chess in 1960 in the town of Great Falls, Montana, provide him with the important sense that there is a larger world out there to be discovered, a sense Del's struggling family has not conveyed to him. I'll quote from the novel and read along. They were the sons of lawyers and doctors at the hospital and talked pretentiously about all sorts of things I knew nothing of but was fiercely interested in. The spy plane incident, Francis Gary Powers, the winds of change, the revolution in Cuba, Kennedy being a Catholic, Patrice Lumumba, whether the executed murderer Carol Chessman had played chess instead of having his last supper, and whether it was right or wrong for baseball players to have their names on their jerseys. Conversations that made me realize I didn't know much that was going on in the world, but needed to. Now, Dell's reflections also illustrate how showing a young person the world out there or some other part of the world out there can be a double-edged sword. For example, Dell is acutely aware of the class difference between the sons of lawyers and doctors and himself, the son of a former Air Force pilot now embroiled in unsuccessful and illegal business ventures. This awareness and the realization that he knows perhaps less of the world than other 15-year-olds might make the world seem a distinctly unwelcoming and hostile place, a place from which to withdraw rather than to seek entry. Thankfully, that is not the effect it has on Dell, who retains both curiosity and a remarkable resilience. But that's not something educators can count on. Educators have the professional responsibility not only for showing newcomers vistas of the world, but also for helping them imagine a livable life for themselves there and assisting them across the threshold. So that's from uh, part from, from my book, Unlocking the World. When I was writing about this, what I did not, the connection I didn't make at the time was that um, I could have written about Del Parsons as having what um, Arjun Abadure calls the capacity to aspire. That seems to me now a very apt phrase to describe it. Abadure introduces this idea of a capacity to aspire in discussion of, quote, why culture matters for the development and for the reduction, uh, for the reduction of poverty. It's a very different context. He discusses the capacity to aspire as a cultural and navigational capacity, that which enables us to imagine and aspire to a range of cultural futures. Such imagined futures, and this is important, um, and, and horizons of aspirations, they're not individual, but collective. And quote, they form parts of wider ethical and metaphysical ideas which derive from large, larger cultural norms. Aspirations are never simply individual, as the economic language of wants and choices inclines us to think. They're always formed in interaction and in the thick of social life. Not only is this capacity to aspire socially uh, produced, it is also unevenly distributed. Those who have more have more opportunities to aspire to. The poorer members of society, precisely because of their lack of opportunities to practice the use of this navigational capacity, have what Apodure calls a more brittle horizon of aspirations. And the challenge for educators, um, uh, in, in this case for developers, but I'm looking at it for educators, is to support those with narrower and more brittle horizons of aspirations in their capacity to aspire, as this capacity affects our sense of agency and their actions. Now, again, I should make it very clear that my discussion of art takes us as a point of departure, not the grinding material poverty that um, Abdurai references um, in, in this chapter. Nonetheless, the idea of the capacity to aspire, the unequal distribution of this capacity, and its relation to the range of imagined cultural futures are completely relevant to the uh, question of art education. The question at the heart of my discussion of access to and the perceived accessibility or inaccessibility of art is what enables somebody who is not already in the world of art, not in the sense that they're an artist, but in the sense that that world feels familiar and accessible to them, to aspire to it. What enables someone who is not already in the world of art to aspire to it? One of my own most memorable points of access to the world of visual art was a classmate in elementary school 
well, more precisely, his parents. I did a practice run of this presentation, flipped the slide earlier, and it seemed like I was pointing to my classmate. Okay, I'm not that old. Um, this was the parent of my classmate, <laughs> his parent. I'm from a working class family, and visual art, or any other parts for that matter, were not a part of mine growing up. However, it so happened that one of my elementary school uh, classmates was Daniel Deckers, son of the visual artist Alt Deckers, who had already passed away by that time, and stepson of the artist Peter Steinman. I didn't realize until much later that both Deckers and Steinman are pretty significant visual artists in, um, in the Dutch uh, art scene and beyond. And I would go to Daniel's house sometimes, uh, to his home in school lunch breaks or after school. His home looked very different from mine. There were strange things on the walls and objects on the floor. It must have been obvious to Daniel's parents, Baker and Dean, that the world of art was unfamiliar to me. Why? And this is probably the most significant. They never tried to teach me. This was just what their home looked like, and I was always made to feel welcome in it. They didn't make art out to be something special, something that required expertise. It was just there to be looked at and I was welcome to share in the looking. In my dissertation, I tell the following vignette from my visits to the Stark home. One day, Peter saw me frowning at an abstract work in their hallway. It was a small work with a simple black line, dot and hook against the white background. Now, I'm pretty sure what was on their wall was not this Malevich drawing, for the record, but I have no trace of what it was that I actually saw, so this gives me some sense of the type of minimalist work that I saw on their wall. What is it? I asked. Peter called Daniel to explain it to me. It's a line, a dot and a hook, said Daniel. Well, yes, I can see that, I said indignantly. But what does it mean? It's supposed to mean a line, a dot and a hook. <laughs> and I think one of the main reasons that this um, experience had remained with me and, and stayed with me so clearly 20 years later, I was writing my dissertation, was the matter of fondness with which Daniel answered my question. He didn't make me feel stupid. He didn't hold the work up as something complicated, too difficult for me to understand, in need of expert explanation. And in fact, he didn't explain it at all. It was a what you see is what you get kind of answer, both leaving me with my puzzlement, but also demonstrating that my classmate, a flesh and blood kid of my own age, was comfortable in this world of art. In fact, so comfortable, he wasn't all that interested in talking about it. He just wanted to get back to drawing and his chemistry bit. So I could rewrite the scene with Del Parsons that I read out earlier. He was the son of an artist, and his home was full of things I knew nothing of but was fiercely interested in. Stark black and white geometric patterns on the walls, objects without any apparent purpose on the floor of the dining room, the original design of an image of the queen and little dots that I knew only as a postage stamp, things that made me realize I didn't know much that was going on. What are the arms doing? The head, the hands, and then, what are they wearing? Are there any other objects on stage? Is the light bright or dim? What color is it? The discovery that I already knew what I needed to look, and that I too had the right to look even though I was not a dance connoisseur, is a memory that can still move me to tears today. That belief that people already know what they need to look at art, and that they have the right to look regardless of their knowledge of art, is one I find in Jacques here. Art or literature emancipates, and I take that to mean it provides an experience that what one already knows and knows how to do is sufficient for entering a new world. Art or literature emancipates when it doesn't tell us how to use art or literature, how we have to understand, how we have to see, how we have to read, and what we have to understand. So the main distinction I seek to make is between art education that tells us how to look and art education that tells us what to see. It's quite possible we need to be reminded of how to look, or even that it's beneficial to have some exercises in looking. But the purpose of this looking is not a decoding of the image to find some deeper meaning hidden within. Tyson Lewis writes about this in his argument for curiosity. <laughs> See, once you're on the web, I can find you. This is a video I still learn. Uh -huh. <laughs> the curious gaze, Tyson, does not penetrate below illusion to an obscure reality. Rather, it is more akin to a glance that reorients the field of the perceptible itself. 
It is the difference between the desire to penetrate below the illusion of the line of Dot and Hook to discover some imagined obscure reality and looking at the image of the line, the dot, and the book itself. How big is that work? Made of what material? How much space is there between the line and the dot? The dot and the book. The book and the line. And so forth. Looking is looking and not decoding, in a quote from Rossier. If the eye doesn't know in advance what it sees, and thought does not know what it should make it, end quote. Now the reason I mentioned that we may have to be reminded how to look, or even have some exercises in looking, is that many of us have been socialized into not looking. Let me try to sketch you a parallel. From, um, oh, in this clip from Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, we see Spock being tested to see whether he has regained his full mental abilities after it had been killed and resurrected in Star Trek III, The Search for Spock. Do not ask me how that worked. I <laughs> but his abilities are being tested, and he's able, as you can see, to respond to a quick succession of questions that involve factual knowledge as well as applied knowledge. He's flummoxed by the last question. How do you feel? It requires his mother, Amanda Grayson, who comes in sort of after where I stop the scene. It, it requires his mother pointing out to Spock that he is half Vulcan and half human, and thus has not only the Vulcan ability to process complex logical problems, but also the human ability to feel. I sometimes imagine students, and I'm thinking here of you know just the, the population of K-12 students may feel a bit like being taken through this kind of testing device, though not necessarily all at once, but over time. Something like this. What is the state capital of Texas? <laughs> <laughs> what factors led to the First World War? Why does a small metal ball drop from a high speed up during its fall? What is the difference between a dominant and a recessive gene? How would you go about testing the acidity of a soil sample? What are the central themes of in of mice and men? What do you see? What do you see? <laughs> I don't understand the question. <laughs> so this question of how do we how do we learn to look um, is I think a very important one. By the time we ask, what do you see? Students may be more likely to go searching, if not for the one right answer, and at least for the kind of answer they think their teacher wants them to do. Now let me make it clear that I'm not arguing against art history, sociology of art, and other art-related fields that legitimately teach about art. My main concern has been art education for a broad audience, as it's done in schools and by art institutions. I've argued for a kind of art education that can make art and art perception available for our horizon of aspirations, and can unlock a world that might otherwise seem off limits. Reminding people that their curiosity and their ability to look as all they need to access the world of art is not to suggest that they may not want to learn something more about it once they're there. As Jeanette Winterson puts it, quote, and she's, she's writing about um, having seen um, uh, a particular painting in, uh, in, a, in a window in a gallery in Amsterdam. She writes, I have fallen in love and I have no language. I was dog -headed. The usual response of this painting has nothing to say to me had become I have, I have nothing to say to this painting, and I desperately wanted to speak." Unquote. 
art history and art criticism and so forth are marvelous realms to delve into once one has discovered one wants to go to and remain in this foreign place of art. However, if we create the suggestion that knowledge about art is what provides legitimate entry to the world of art, I think we've got it the wrong way around. Art education matters, in my view, because the world of art has mattered as a realm of human experience and activity around the world and throughout the centuries. Hospitality into the world of art recognizes that this significant area of human experience and activity ought to be open to newcomers, just as other realms like science and language. Art education, as I advocated, assumes not that art is good for you, but observes simply that art is. Indeed, art is, and its very fairness is the starting point of hospitable art education. If art is there, wherever that is, of course, you can be there too. So uh, I guess I'll just start off with a comment and a question, and then I'll open it up to the audience. Uh, first off, I couldn't help but think um, about this question of what is a hospitable art education in, in relation to museums. We have a lot of museum educators here in the audience. Um, and I was thinking about what the common sense notion of hospitality and education in, in museums would be today, right? So I'm thinking of like, uh, uh, Come and have friends, uh, you know, with your friends and family, and have a fun weekend in the museum, right? Or uh, something like, um, you know, the way in which museums frame their frame, no pun intended, frame their uh, uh, audience as consumers of a sort of set of goods, right? Um, and it seemed like what you're getting at is sort of problematizing that notion of hospitality or trying to reclaim hospitality from from the normal way we think about hospitality, right? And posing a sort of a new understanding what hospitality could mean in, ed in, uh, in education, in art education, but in museum education. And so you, you made this claim that um, art education should not tell us necessarily what we're looking at, but how to look. Is that correct? It, tell, it, should, it should not tell us what to see. Not tell us what to see, but how to look. And I'm wondering if there's a, is there a difference there between sort of the fundamental gesture of the art educator as, you know, sort of how to look at something, not what to see, but how to look, versus just look. Right? Um, uh, it seems as, as though one is, um, like how to look, to me, seems to imply that the art educator still has some kind of expertise, right, and is uh, uh, some, making some sort of normative claim on the student, like here's the proper way to look. And does that sort of devolve into a, 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 another form of paternalism that you are worried about? Yeah, no, I can see how it can be interpreted that way. I think the, the reason I talked about it that way um, was precisely because when I got the assignment to look at, at modern art, initially that was the assignment, to look. And I just kind of went like, I am not supposed to do that. I have no like, look. So it had to be pointed out to me that there were things to be looked at. Look, there's a stage. There are bodies. Things that are so obvious that likewise, I might be able to line the dot in the book. Well, yeah, duh, I can see that. Well, there are bodies. There's stage. There are costumes. There are lighting. Bodies are moving. Legs are moving. Hands are moving. Are they high? Are they low? Are they fast? Are they fat? And so it, it needed, I needed that reminder that, oh, I do know how to do this. But when somebody first said to me, just look and then tell me what you've seen, I had absolutely no idea what to do. So I think that's, I do, I do understand what you're saying, that there is a risk that, you know, this is the right way to look at it. And look. So I think that's a, the how to look, the right way to look, when it goes into a kind of decoding, when it goes into a deciphering, that's sort of the concern. And I'm not saying those are always bad, I just don't think those are... Um, Those are not the most emancipatory way. In, right? That's why because somebody at some point says, I want to know more about it. Tell me you know, something about what was going on with the symbolism in these old paintings. Fantastic. That's it. Let's, have, let's talk about that. Um, but uh, yeah, I think part of it's just the experience of initially. If you say, well, just look at it. Sometimes you need to point out, okay, is it big? Is it small? Does it have color? Does it not have color? Is it oil? 
if you look up close, can you see the paint stick out or is it flat? Is it, what is it? That, just, just to give point to people, well, I, okay, I can do that. I don't need some, right? That reminder, yeah, I know how to do that. That's kind of what you're trying to get. Okay. Um, oh, one more question. Um, oh, and I, actually, because you're talking about museum education. Sure. This um, image um, is from the Dulles Image <coughs> Gallery, um, which is um, a portrait gallery, mostly a portrait, some landscapes um, gallery in the south of London near Brixton. Um, it's a very traditional kind of museum that you might not imagine is actually very interesting um, for kids. And this, um, this image is from an event they had called, I don't call pillows and pictures or pillows and paintings. And it's a sleepover. Um, in the art gallery. Um, now, I went to the Dollar Street Gallery many years ago, and I was actually extremely impressed by what they were doing. So I also want to talk about some things that you made out as sort of bad forms of hospitality. There's no one size fits all. Like, it depends on what you're doing. What I really like about what they're doing is the pictures are what they are. They're Reynolds. They're Rembrandt. They're pictures that you might not think are particularly appealing to very, very um, ethnically diverse groups of kids coming through here. What they do extremely well is just saying to the kids, this is your space. It's in your neighborhood. Like for a long time, they would tell other visitors, by the way, if you come to the Dulwich Picture Gallery, you may have to step over kids because they're all lying flat in their stomachs drawing. So deal with it because, you know, this is their space. And so I really like the way they just left the art the way it was. They, try, they weren't trying to do something to the art. They were, you know, they were just trying to get, because this is your space. So what do you do in this space? You want to sit and draw it? Sounds like a great idea to me. Or they'd say, look at it. Now look again, is there anything odd about this painting? And kids will see, kids, kids will go, that tree is blue, right? They go, tree is blue, that's fascinating. Why is a tree blue? Right? And they, they actually have a, they have a program called Arts and Science Alliance um, in which they talk about the chemistry of paint and what happens to old paint. And the yellow fades over time and the blue doesn't and the green tree becomes blue. And, right, the kid, but they were actually learning to look um, in a way that that was, yes, it was accessible, but they weren't actually talking about any deep meaning of the painting or the content of the, they were still focused on the looking. And this was the most, um, unobvious place to do that. This, the, the paintings that they have there, it's a permanent collection, are not what you think of when you think of accessible art. But they did a fabulous job, so I just wanted to put this in there. Uh, so yeah, one more follow-up, quick follow-up question. Um, you've talked a lot in your presentation about the agency that art educators have, or museum educators, um, and uh, sort of the I wouldn't say pedagogy of museum education, but at least the sort of educational gesture, maybe, of the museum educator, the art educator. And I'm just wondering, uh, you did mention the possibility of the art itself as having a kind of educational gesture. Um, uh, is it possible that the uh, art teaches us how to look at it? I am really, really cautious with that kind of description. Um, because I'm very uncomfortable with investing art for the pedagogical purpose. Um, I very much agree with, if you read any of the work of John Balakino, with that sense that it, the, the, that's why I like more, it's there. It's just a sheer thereness. It's there. It's there. It doesn't go anywhere. Um, it's there. It's not there to teach you something. It's not there to tell you something. It's just there. That's not to say that you may not take something from it, that you do something with it, that but the idea that the work is there to teach you something um, is not one I would underscore. Okay, I'm going to open it up for questions and comments from the audience. Yes, Liz. Oh, well, this just kind of goes along with what you were just saying, I think, because... Um, okay, so I saw the De Botton and Armstrong Artist Therapy. There's a YouTube. So it's like two, three minutes, mm -hmm. and I used it as, a, as an introduction to my art appreciation class, <coughs> and I thought it was good. I thought, yes, that is one way to think about art, and it was a jumping off point. So, you know, along the same lines, you know, art does offer therapy to people, so, I mean, I think it's a, a, a different way to look at what art can do for people, and I was just curious, um, I mean, I didn't read the book. 
I thought, I mean, it might be interesting to look at. But your critique of it is pretty strong, so I wondered if there's any other story behind the critique of it, other than, like, you read the book and said, this is way too didactic, or it's... Um, it is. I just find a lot of their premises really problematic. Um, there was another um, critic, Callum Bakers, who wrote in a Dutch um, magazine as well. So this whole premise, and that's why you go to the first slide, it shows this enormous lineup of people trying to get into the Louvre. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of um, art, big art galleries that have that same uh, phenomenon. So, Carl Pater's question was like, they're diagnosing this big problem of people having these troublesome encounters with art where they don't get out of it what they do. And he said, really? Would all those people, just be clueless dudes, all the long, long lineups for all those museums, they need, the art. Like, he's just like, I don't, I, I don't buy it. Um, I don't buy it either. Um, I think that um, what I find really problematic is that they did not position it as, here is a way to add a layer of something to the many layers you can take to. They're like, you know, art is often unsatisfactory. We don't get anything out of it. We wonder why the heck am I supposed to look at this? Look, this is what it's for. The, the, the middle section of this paper is from a larger paper that's under review right now um, that describes the approach they take. I call it the life hack approach to art education. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I can, I can, well, I can if I find a slide quickly, I can pull up uh, the slide from the other presentation. You know, life hacks, those things where you turn something that's kind of useless into something that's valuable. Like, look, how to turn this empty shampoo bottle into a, 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 a sunglass holder. You know that. <laughs> And so what they're, what they're really saying is, look, look at this useless work of art. You have to turn this useless work of art into something quite handy. It's part, it's part of your therapy. I find it deeply offensive. I find their, their approach really, really offensive. It overburdens art with stuff that's not inherent in the art. If you just talk about, look, we have come up with this other layer to work with art, fabulous. You leave all the other possible ways of engagement alone. That's not their approach. I am baffled that some of those museums actually participated in the project. So. Yeah, those were awfully large sticky notes. Yes. <laughs> they were big, they were all over the place, they were diagonal, they were in, they were in the stairwells. They were, and I, I mean, the current director of the Dutch National Museum is not somebody who actually uh, bends to the public pressure of reaching to a larger audience. He was one of at that time, when I interviewed him for the policy, he was the director of the Kunsthalle, which is a modern art gallery in Rotterdam. He's now the director of the National uh, Museum in <coughs> which participated in this. <coughs> I, I, <laughs> from the way he talked about that impulse to talk to a larger audience and a really kind of, um, I, I didn't seem like the same person to participate in that. Yes. The way that you're, the way that you've been talking about um, that particular, I guess, program that they were doing, the sticky notes, does it seem that they took more of a um, kind of consumerist approach to the way that they're presenting art? Like, because I know people will talk about this all the time, especially now, that like we're being given, we're being told to get products, we're told how to use them, mm -hmm. and that kind of, that regardless of whether or not we actually want to use it that way, we're or we've considered it, that there were this constant telling and explanation of how things should be used, how they should be consumed, and that sort of thing. Is it kind of, yeah. is that the sort of film that you're getting yeah. from that? Definitely. Okay. Oh. The same line. And also, really, it's a set of, look, it has, it has instrumental use. I really like works of art that annoy us. You know, and Winterson has this fabulous description of, like, you know, she's like, have you ever spent an hour with a painting in an art gallery? And she goes through a sort of brief phenomenology. You know, she says, first you look at the painting and you know, you're kind of curious. And then you get annoyed. You know? Then you're like, well, who are you that you, know, you get to hang there and like, demand an hour of my time? <laughs> like, I've got nothing. Like, what, right? And I actually really like it that art does that. I really appreciate, in that sense, the uselessness of art. And it's their, you know, they're turning art into, they're focusing on the utility of art. It can help us feel more hopeful. It can help us feel redemption. It can help us, um, it can help us reconnect with the sensuality in our life. It can help us see our they have a whole discussion on a bunch of asparagus by Mane that's about seeing your partner in a new light. And I'm like, it's a pretty gorgeous bunch of asparagus. And there's a fabulous story actually to all this to Mane's asparagus, but that's not what it's about. And they're actually not encouraging people to look at all. And so it's yeah, it's very much about consuming for another purpose. Yeah. 
is it, it kind of feels to me that like they're kind of undercutting the message they're trying to get across. Like, here we want you to think deeply and apply art, but by telling you how to apply it, they're not really giving you the opportunity to actually give some, like, get some deeper meaning to it, because you're not able to think for yourself in a way. Yeah, or just not, not to get meaning at all. To just, to just dwell with it. To just spend time with that work. Not knowing at all what you're, what you're supposed to think of it. So that, you know, is a kind of, I, it's, it's there, and I'm here. Interesting, now we're both in the same room, now what? Um, I was wondering if you like think it's a realistic goal for museums to create welcome spaces in a sense that like to not exclude anybody is that like a real possibility in your mind? Mm -hmm. No. So the one part of the uh, the one part of the uh, one part of the title that I didn't talk about at all um, is uh, is the aporia of access. And the aporia in Derrida's work is um, a stuck place place from which you cannot move. I mean, the term aporia has a connection to a pore, like a pore in your skin, for example. And so an aporia is a place where you can't really, um, you can't really get out. You can kind of move through, but it's a, it's a kind of impasse, a stuck place. So the interesting thing with the ethic of hospitality is that it is not an ideal. You can't get it right. If you were to say, what would be the most hospitable gesture? Imagine the most hospitable gesture of an art gallery might be to say, we're leaving the doors unlocked 24-7. Everybody can come in. There's no charge. It's now accessible to everybody. Well, at that point, you stand a significant risk of losing the art gallery altogether. And you no longer have the opportunity to offer hospitality from it at all. It's a bit like what might happen in your own home. If you say, how am I a hospitable host? I'm just going to throw the doors open. Anybody can come in at any time, right? So it isn't an ideal that you can realize. I think it is that kind of nagging feeling that when you play by the rules, of this is how we're supposed to make things hospitable. This is how our flyers are supposed to look. This is how our entrance is supposed to look. This is how our educational programs are supposed to look. If you don't kind of ask yourself, this niggling question of what might happen if somebody unexpected arrives, the person who is not for whom this is intended, right? How hospitable is this? Who is being excluded? Who is being, not so that you can fix it and include everybody, but just so that you keep in mind that there's no getting it right. And that's, and that's, that's with any form of education, that there's this, there's this you know, dual thing that in the role of host, we want to prepare for the guest. But we have no idea what our guess is. So we don't know whether we're getting it right. So we prepare nonetheless, and then they either may not come at all, or they may come and want something quite, quite different. And so we, you know, we keep kind of messing around with that. Um, so in, in the book I go through these three aporias that are in hospitality. But so it's a, it's a great question, and the desire is to get it right. Um, and it's not meant to let you off the hook. So I'll just stop trying, because you can't get it right anyway. Um, but it's really kind of there to say it is not realizable. It is not, you can't perfect hospitality. Well, I wasn't like just super pessimistic. Like, I don't know if that, I'd ever get that right. No, no, I, I don't think you would. <laughs> <laughs> but for Derrida, that doesn't mean give up on it. Not at all. No, not at all. Um, um, and in fact, it goes, I mean, if you think about all kinds of parallels, right? A lot of people are thinking about questions of hospitality in relation to borders and immigration. And so he says, listen, there too, the question is not give up on old orders, because it's not, I understand that policy can't work that way. So he's talking about the difference between the laws or the rules of hospitality and what he calls that bigger kind of law of hospitality, that which we can't actually achieve. And then he makes to me what's still a really pertinent comment is any laws, small l, of hospitality that forget the need to maintain some relation to the law of hospitality are laws or rules that become unjust. And that's why I talked about, for me, the vigilance and the niggling feeling that you might not be doing enough is actually really important. Nora, your hand is up. Sure. Um, I'm just wondering if there's a But uh, I would like to know what you think about teaching slow looking <coughs> yeah, one of my um, one of the 
the most heartbreaking scenes I always find um, in museums is kids who are doing a worksheet. Um, please go and make sure you see this and look at that. And you know what is the what is the what is the artist of this painting and what is the object of that and what is that right? Um, and and then sometimes there's this little kid who um, who doesn't who just kind of forgets about the worksheet because they've latched onto something, right? That is precisely so. Like especially younger kids, they will they will engage in slow looking whether you want them to or not. Um, and I've seen galleries where this happened, and it's great. Like you see, the sun is turned on. It's like, come on, we're moving to the next one. Like, and, no, come on, like, we're, like the, you know, that guy just moved. Like you have to. <laughs> <laughs> They're not moving, right? And so, in a way, it's one of those. It's again not one of these. How do you have to teach that? But how do you have to? How do you have to unlearn the moving along? So I think very much like giving kids space to figure out what they want to look at. And in some way, and for some kids, that's going to be the fire hydrant on the wall. That's not going to be the work of art. <laughs> and so sometimes, you know, you, you want to look at it and say, okay, what can we what can we do with this? But kids will pick something they want to look at, and they want to look at it for a long time. Um, and I think that's really marvelous. And it's not to say that, again, not all forms of art education are about art perception, which is what I have focused on. Sometimes very legitimately, right? We are now in a program of art history. And so, yeah, you know, we, we actually don't want you now in an undergrad class, and we, we don't want you to stand there and latch onto one painting the whole time, because we actually want to talk about the difference between, you know, impressionism and expressionism, or, you know? And so there are all kinds of legitimate contexts, which I have had a focus on younger children, that broad audience, the folks who are, who are first. If you don't get it from your family, you can get that sense of I find it very fascinating that um, you talk about being the gracious host and trying to define what is good for a different type of audience. And for someone that loves hosting anything and everything, um, when you say um, to just look at something, it's to take that step back from being that, do you need anything, and letting them explore and become um, what they need to in that space for their own right and for their own exploration and growth is so amazing. Mm -hmm. And I cannot wait to get a group of kids and explore this with them because I think that that's just a new way to invite more people and to um, give more of an opportunity for others to explore something otherwise they wouldn't. And so... But it's interesting to be like, you know, this is often art educators are enthusiastic about art. Right. Right? And so they want to be the host who yeah. has, like, you know, the best canapes and, like, the best drinks and the matching napkins and all, right? And it's that's precisely not the point of right. an ethic of hospitality. Um, and in fact, it is a much more minimalist kind of gesture um, where it isn't care less. It isn't that you don't think about who your guests might be but you're definitely not reinforcing your hostness, your comfort in that space. Look, this is my world, which right, might actually keep people at a distance. It's much more kind of, look, I happen to be host in this world. Why? Because somebody else would happen to receive me at some point before this. That's how I got to be here, temporarily, as a host. You know what my role is? To make sure that you feel welcome in this world. That's what it's about. It's not about me as a host. It's not about how good my outfit is. It's not about whether or not I found the matching napkins at all. <laughs> it's just about can I can I make you feel welcome? Okay. Other questions, comments? Yes. Um what in like your experience have you done when you have maybe a group of kids or you're just with, like one person who's completely uninterested in art in general? Like it's not the fact that they don't feel welcome; it's just they don't want to do it today. No, <laughs> <laughs> no I mean I think there is actually something about like you know the trick with kids is to figure out are they just saying well, I'm just not interested. 
because that's the easiest way to say, I don't feel comfortable there. But that's why it's in and of itself, to me, the answer, I don't want to go there, or I don't want to hang out there, is like, why is that any different from me saying, yeah, I don't think I want to go to China. <coughs> Maybe I'll go to India, but I don't think I want to go to China. Nobody's judging that I am now inadequate in my moral and aesthetic edification. So what is it that if a kid now says, yeah, I don't want to go there, I don't want to go skateboarding. What is, uh, what, so my point is more to interrogate at what point we have the impulse to say, You're, we're not elevating you to this higher level of humanity if you don't engage with art. Right? I mean, I think there's a lot of art by stealth. The thing is, there's art everywhere. Right? So it may well be, like, art museums are often really bizarre places. Right? They are also bizarre places by virtue of the people who tend to feel welcome there. Um, um, so, I probably shouldn't say this, but this is kind of like, maybe this is more of a European phenomenon as well, but, man, it's a great trip. <laughs> <laughs> I learned this during my undergrad degree. I was clueless. And then I took the art and culture stream and thought, what dress an old black? Nobody will realize I don't belong here. <laughs> and it's really interesting because then I got to hang out in museums undercover. <laughs> I was like working class undercover, right? And it's like, I'm wearing black and nobody can tell I shouldn't be here. And there's really, I mean, it's, this sounds kind of flippant, but there is something truly about a sense of access in some art museums and the way they're set up and the kind of folks who, who feel obviously feel comfortable there. Uh, that can be uncomfortable for other people. And so for some, it's like, let's start with art in public spaces. Let's start in art in unobvious spaces. Uh, but there's also a kind of art by stealth and undercover art that I think is quite, um, quite workable. Yes. I was curious about your thoughts about an interpretive material from the galleries. That, you know, they're there for the patron that they wish to look at, but they're not necessarily. I and mean, that's something that you... I just like to hear what you thought about them. Yeah, no, I think those are great. Yeah, those are absolutely great. They are they are there exactly for that, you know, because you, you walk through sometimes and you think, I'm really curious. Like I've looked at this, I can't even tell what it is. Like what the is this what? Is this copper? Is this I can't even tell what it is. So it's like, oh look, I can go look it up. And then I realize, wow, there's this other little story and it's great and I can but I can decide what I want to take in. Um, and I'm the one to go find it. And I think those are fabulous, and there's all kinds of ways in which we can do that. You can do it in interactive ways, you can do it with screens, and people can go look it up. You can do it just in, you know, binders and in paper ways. Um, you can have uh, physical human beings that are not there to guide you, but that you can go ask questions, right? Um, there's all kinds of ways in which we can do that, but I really like it if you can go, then you're the one who's there. You're the one who picks what you latch onto. You're the one who decides what you want to know more about. Um, and I, I think, you know, again, it gets used. Um, absolutely, I think those are great to have. Yeah, it's not it's not about deliberately withholding information from people, yeah. um, or withholding interpretations, or withholding perspectives, or withholding histories, or with, right. That's not the point. Um, but yeah, you know, I think sometimes it's almost um, Derrida has written about this in other ways. There is this sense if you look in a museum, very often what you see is this. something else that goes back to <clears throat> that the idea that we feel like we don't have any say as to what we feel or think about that work until we feel that we've already become expert in it, right? So the word is what is going to give us that feeling of expertise as opposed to the looking. Yeah, 
And so, you know, what's wrong? Somebody walk, walks up to Mark Rothko and says, I have no idea why, but I hate this thing. Like, I actually love it. I, it's not something my children hate this thing. It's not just because you don't, you don't like the way the colors go together. And then, what? No, it's nothing to do with that. I just, it just makes me really, like, I really dislike it. Right? It's like, why is that not okay? You can't still say, oh, I really, you can later say, I really appreciate the significance of this work in the cultural canon. And I really dislike it. <laughs> I think both of those are entirely possible. And so why is it that we can't, like, just free ourselves to say, I, I can actually have a response to it. I can be affected by it. And then I can decide whether I want to know more about it or not. Anything else? All right, well, uh, please join me in thanking our guests.